Hi, in this video we'll look at the code for the rational numbers video. So the first thing we'll need to do is to import our fractions class from the module. So we'll say uh, from, we'll actually just import the fraction class. So from fractions, which is the module name, import fraction with a capital F, which is the class. Remember that naming convention that we talked about earlier in the course? where our packages and modules use lowercase letters and then classes used an uppercase letter for the first letter. So it's just following that convention there. Now we can take a look at some help on that uh, fraction object, that fraction class. Now you can certainly just, you know, go to Google and do a search for that, look up the Python documentation, or you can also get help directly here within Python and we can call it this way right? Just the same way we did uh, with integers. So here it will give you some information about the fraction class. It will talk to you about the different constructors. So let's look at the constructors. And the first one, as you know, we can just use a single integer number. What that means is that it's going to use the constructor that takes in a numerator and a denominator. But here the denominator is not specified. We've just specified the numerator. We haven't specified the denominator, so the denominator will default to 1. And in fact, we get fraction 1 over 1. Now, you can also, if you want, write it this way. Denominator equals 1, right? And then maybe we want to do our numerator equals 2. You can write it that way, right? You can name your parameters. You can also just write it as fraction 1 comma 2. The advantage, by the way, of using named parameters here is that if we take this... Let me copy paste and we'll write here numerator and denominator. Now I don't have to specify the numerator and denominator in the specific sequence. We can do it this way and it still works just fine. So just on a side note. So we can use those kinds of you know constructors that use the denominator and the num numerator. And we have other constructors as well that we discussed, right? We can look at a fraction of 0 0.125, which we know should be 1 8th, and that's in fact what we get. We can also use a string, so we might say 0 0.125 is a string, that would work just as well, right? Or, which is really interesting, we could say fraction 22 divided by 7. So our string looks like a fraction, and Python will be able to pass that and return a fraction of 22 over 7. Now, we also have all the different arithmetic operators that we can use. So, for example, let's say x equals fraction 2 comma 3. Let's say y equals fraction 3 comma 4. Okay, so now, for example, let's do something like um, x plus y, which is 2 thirds plus 3 quarters. Well, that will be 17 over 12. And if you want, you can check that. Um, but as you can see, the common, uh, the greatest common denominator would be 12, right? So we end up with four 12s here and nine 12s here. Well, uh, eight, sorry, eight 12s and nine 12s. And so eight plus nine is 17 divided by 12. So that seems like that's correct. So we can also say x times y. And x times y will be one half. Two thirds times three quarters is one half. And you can do x divided by y as well, and so forth. So all the arithmetic operators work, and they will always return a fraction type object. Now, fractions also, remember I mentioned, are automatically reduced. So if we look at fraction, of 8 divided by 16. Well, 8 16 is really 1 half, and in fact, that's what Python does for us. As you can see, it returned fraction 1 comma 2. Also, we talked about the negative numbers. So if we do 1 comma negative 4, which is negative 1 quarter, well, we can put the negative sign above or below the line. It doesn't matter. It's mathematically equivalent. And Python will choose to put the negative sign with the numerator. Speaking of numerator, we can recover the numerator and denominator of a fraction. So let's say we do this, x equals fraction, 1 comma negative 4, okay, which remember is this 1 uh, with a negative sign comma 4, 
we can recover the numerator by looking at the numerator property of that object. That will return negative 1. And similarly, we can look at the denominator by looking at that property, and we get the denominator back. So that's how you get the numerator and the denominator. Now, one thing we talked about was the fact that floats have a finite precision, right? So any real number in Python is represented using a finite number of digits. And therefore, they're actually all rational numbers. And to look at that, we're going to work with some irrational numbers like pi and square root of 2. So let's go ahead and say x equals fraction of math dot pi. Okay, so if we print out x, this is the fraction that we get. Now, what's the equivalent float? Well, that's the float that it's representing. But you can see that we have a rational number. Now, pi is not rational. The only reason we get a rational number is because pi in our computer can only be represented up to a certain limited number of digits. Therefore, it's a rational number. Therefore, it can be expressed as a fraction. Similarly, if we say I'll use y equals fraction of math dot square root of 2. Then when we print y, well, let's just print y. And then if we look at the float of y, you know, we'll get our 1.414 something, which we would expect. But because, again, it has a finite representation, it is a rational number. And this is the equivalent fraction that can be used to approximate square root of 2. So even though they're irrational, we can still approximate them. Okay. Now, I lastly want to point out that not all floating point numbers can be represented precisely or exactly in a computer. And we'll get to that in an upcoming video on floats. But let's look at um, 1 eighth or 0 0.125. So let's say I say A equals 0 0.125. Now, if we print this out, okay, so if we print A, it tells us 0 0.125. Great, that looks good. Now, let's take B equal to 0 0.3, 3 tenths, right? And let's print B out. Well, 0 0.3 looks good, right? So now, let's look at the fraction of A. Well, 1 eighth, that's good, that's what we expected. And let's look at the fraction of B, and we would expect 3 tenths. But that's not what we get. We get something that really looks, you know, pretty awful. So what's going on? Well, remember what I said earlier, 0 0.3 cannot be represented exactly. But it looks like it is, right? When we print B, we get 0 0.3, right? We, we get 0 0.3. That looks exact. Well, the problem is that Python is kind of hiding stuff from us because it's trying to give us a nice display. So it's really a display issue here. It's displaying 0 0.3, but that's not in reality what's actually being stored, even though we specified b was precisely equal to 0 0.3. In order to see that, we can format the number and force Python to give us more significant digits in the display. So, for example, we might say format b and give us five decimal, you know, five digits after the decimal point. And we get 0 0.30000. Well, that, that looks still fine, right? That still looks exact. So let's pump that up. Let's go to maybe, um, let's, let's look at 15 digits, right? After the decimal point. And that still looks good, right? So let's pump that up further. And this time we'll go to like 25. And now we'll start seeing the difference. So now you can see that 0 0.3 is not actually stored as 0 0.3 in Python. It's stored as the 0 0.299, all these nines, but then you can see 888, right? It's not 0 0.3. And so because of that, when we look at the fraction of B, we get that. That's why we get that huge fraction. Now, if we know that our float, you know, has a certain number, you know, has a certain constraint on how big, you know, the denominator can become, then we can use that limit denominator method to actually, you know, get an, a, get an approximation of this float here using a fraction whose denominator doesn't exceed a certain amount. And so we could do something like this. If we say x equals fraction 
of 0 0.3, okay? Then we can say x.limit denominator, and we can specify that the limit, let's say, would be 10. So we don't want a denominator greater than 10. And we get 3 tenths back, right? So now we have our 3 tenths. So of course this works with any floating point number. So we could say x equals fraction of math dot pi. Okay, so if we print x, let's just print it this way, we get this fraction over here. We can look at the floating point equivalent of x, that's 3.1415, etc. That's an approximation of pi, pi being of course irrational uh, and actually transcendental. You don't get a finite number of digits to represent pi and it never, you know, you, you never get recurring uh, digits. So, or recurring sequences of digits, I should say, to be more precise. So we can get approximations of pi uh, with other fractions by using this limit denominator. So we might say x dot limit denominator and we'll limit the denominator to 10, let's say. So what's the closest fraction that we can get to x but with a denominator of no greater than 10? And so we get 22 over 7. And if we look at 22 divided by 7, well, that's approximately pi, right? 3.14, and then after that, it, you know, falls off. But of course, we can go further. We can say limit denominator, um, let's say 100, and we get 311, 311 over 99. And you can go further if you want, let's say 10,000. Well, you know, for 10,000, it still sticks to 113. So how about 100,000? Now we get this fraction here. And if we try and evaluate that fraction, we can do it in one of two ways. I guess let's do it this way. I'll copy that and copy this one. And there we, we go. Okay, that's our approximation to pi now using a fraction whose denominator cannot exceed 100,000. All right, so that can be pr pretty useful when you want to constrain your denominator. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the upcoming video on floats.